Hello and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to today's webinar. I am Mohit Goel, a practicing advocate, partner at Simmons and Attorneys at Law, and a co-moderator for today's webinar. The topic for today's webinar: injunction and damages in patent litigation, consideration and challenges. Is, to my view, a rather interesting one. It is both relevant and relatable to patent litigation strategies and across the globe. Both injunctions and damages. Which have their own considerations, and courts and practitioners are often faced with various challenges in dealing with the grant or denial of these reliefs in a time-bound manner. To discuss these considerations and challenges, we have today an esteemed panel of guests. First and foremost, we are deeply privileged and extremely grateful to have with us as our guest of honor, Honorable Justice Manmohan, sitting judge of the Delhi High Court. Justice Manmohan was on the original side master and on the commercial division roster of the Delhi High Court for many years. While on these rosters, Justice Manmohan heard several IP disputes, including patent disputes, such as the SCP infringement litigations. He has pronounced various judgments, which have today become landmark decisions in their own right. Since time will not permit me to set out the list of all these judgments. I want to specifically mention his judgment in the case of UTV software. In this case, Justice Manmohan for the first time laid down law on the principle of dynamic injunctions, which to my view would be relevant to even patent disputes and for today's topic. Thank you, sir, for accepting our invitation. Our next eminent speaker is Mr. Gaurav Pachnanda. Mr. Pachnanda, a Felix scholar, is a senior advocate whose practice is focused mainly on commercial and corporate litigation, including domestic and international arbitrations, with a significant multi jurisdictional component. Mr. Prashnanda is regularly engaged in IP disputes, including many patent litigations. Mr. Prashnanda is a door tenant at Fountain Court Chambers, London, and a, and a registered foreign lawyer at the Singapore International Commercial Court. Sir, we are extremely grateful that you accepted our invitation to speak on, to the, on the topic of today's webinar. Thank you, sir. Our next eminent speaker for the day is Mr. Jeffrey Chapman. Mr. Chapman is a Queen's Counsel and a Barrister at Council Chambers, London. He is frequently instructed in many high profile commercial disputes, including patent litigations in UK. Most recently, Mr. Chapman appeared in the largest ever claim for damages on a cross undertaking ever brought in the patent court in the UK. He will surely discuss some important aspects relating to this topic from an English law perspective. We are again extremely grateful that he accepted our invitation to speak on the topic of today's webinar. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. Last but not the least, I would like to introduce partner in crime, Mr. Sidhan Goyal, a practicing partner at Simmons and Attorneys at Law and a co-moderator for today's webinar. Sidhan's practice focuses mainly on commercial litigation and is today leading several patent disputes and litigations before various forums across India. He regularly advises clients on, on constructing global enforcement strategies for their patent portfolios. And without taking any further time, I will now request Sidhan to get things started. Thank you, Mohit, for the introductions. We are indeed grateful and privileged to have such a distinguished panel with us today to speak on today's topic. To start things off, I will now request Justice Manmohan to offer his views on today's topic. Uh, thank you. Uh, respected uh, Gaurav Panchanda, Panchanda ji, Mr. Chapman, Mr. Sidhan, Mr. Mohit, ladies and gentlemen. After a long time, I have been asked to open an innings Normally, after everyone has batted, I am asked to step in. So I will introduce the concept and leave it to the big hitters, like my learned friends who are eminent counsel, to entertain you in the slog overs. Patent matters are never easy, and patent attorneys are not the easiest persons to deal with. It is said that an optimist would describe a glass containing water as a glass half full, a pessimist would describe it as half empty. A patent attorney is said to describe it as liquid 
H2O bisects an open cylindrical vessel. But I will try to keep the introduction simple. The object of patent law is to primarily promote research, new technology, and industrial progress. Grant of exclusive privilege to own use either the process or the product patent for a limited period that is about 20 years is, is to stimulate new inventions of commercial utility. It also serves a larger public purpose because after 20 years, the patent passes into the public domain. The fundamental principle of patent law is that patent is granted only for an invention which has some novelty, some utility. That is, it must be new and useful. In fact, Kerr on Law and Practice of Injunction, sixth edition, discusses principles which may act as guiding factors for grant of injunction in patent cases. The said factors are stated as follows, and I quote, if a clear instance of infringement or a strong prima facie case of infringement is made out and the plaintiff has not been guilty of latches, the court will generally grant an interlocutory injunction in following cases when the validity of the patent has already been established in a previous action, when the patent is of old standing and the enjoyment under it has been uninterrupted, and when the validity of the patent is not an issue and notwithstanding that defendant offers to keep an account. To drive home the point, let me give you a few instances. In a patent suit pertaining to a pharmaceutical product, uh, Cetagliptin, the Delhi High Court, after a prolonged trial, issued a certificate of validity to the suit patent. Thereafter, the owner of this patent filed a number of suits against various third party who were infringing their patent. Normally, in all those cases, ex parte ad interim temporary injunctions were granted because of the certificate of validity granted in the previous litigation. There may also be cases where the defendant who, despite an injunction order, continues to manufacture the infringing product by either changing its model number or its own name. In the case of UTV, which was just referred to, which pertained to copyright infringement, I passed a dynamic injunction order, which meant blocking new means of accessing the same infringing website. However, if the challenge to the patent is credible, then the court should accept the challenge and refuse the injunction. These are the two ends of the spectrum as they were. But the real biggest challenge in the grant of injunction in patent litigation comes when the defendant files a counterclaim or a plea for revocation. It is then that the court's job in balancing equities becomes paramount, especially as with the commercial court's regime in place, there is need to expedite the prosecution of patent litigations in India. While dealing with such defenses of invalidation of patents, it is important not to turn the stage of interim applications into a mini trial and thereby defeat the purpose of commercial courts regime that aims at expeditious prosecution of cases. Ordinarily, it takes several hearings for the parties to address the court on technical aspects relating to patents. The courts also cannot be expected to completely understand and appreciate the nuances of the technology being asserted at the interim stage in, in such a short span of time especially without the benefit of the evidence of the parties, which often includes testimonies of experts from the field. Of course, there are many cases where the parties make out such compelling cases that it is difficult to refrain yourself from turning the stage of interim relief into a mini trial. Considerations at that stage broadly include the principles which are well settled, namely prima facie case, balance of convenience, and irreparable injury. There is a line of authorities emerging from the United States stating that public interest is the fourth ground to refuse the injunction if the injunction to be granted in a given case is oppressive or extremely harsh to the society. 
or to the affected industry. For instance, in all patent cases pertaining to pharmaceutical industries, the defense taken by the infringer is that public interest would suffer if an injunction is granted in as much as the teeming millions of a developing country would not be able to make use or take advantage of the new drug. I must say public interest is a flexible concept when it comes to its applicability in the field of intellectual property. It is not necessary that public interest always lies against the protection of intellectual property rights. It is thus a question of fact which has to be decided on case to case basis as to where the public interest lies in that case. Consequently, the application of these principles again turns on the facts based on which the courts do grant or refuse injunctions outright. However, in many cases where a plaintiff is granted an injunction, delays are seen from the plaintiff's side, while if the plaintiff is denied an injunction, delays are seen from the defendant's side. The need of the R is therefore to look beyond the typical grant or refusal of injunction and turn the stage of interim relief into a solution for expeditious disposal of patent litigations. A few approaches that I would consider extremely practical in cases where the plaintiff patentee is able to prior fish I show that the defendant is infringing the suit patent, but the defendant also presents a credible challenge to the validity of the suit patent at the interim stage could be as follows. A. Direct the defendant to deposit with the court by way of a bank guarantee. A portion of the proceeds received from the sale of the alleged infringing products made in the past, as well as during the pendency of the case on an ongoing basis as has been ordered in several standard essential patent matters, such as ordered by the division bench of the Delhi High Court in the case of Giovanni versus Ericsson. B, direct the defendant to deposit with the court in cash a portion of the post, uh, proceeds received from the sale of the alleged infringing product made in the past as well as during the pendency of the case on an ongoing basis. C, direct the defendant to deposit with the court a lump sum amount from the portion of the proceeds received from sale of the alleged infringing products by way of a bank guarantee. D, direct the defendant to deposit with the court a lump sum amount from the portion of the proceeds received from sale of the alleged infringing products by way of a cash deposit. E, direct the defendants to deposit with the court a combination of bank guarantee and cash deposit, a portion of the proceeds received from sale of the alleged infringing products made in the past as well as during the pendency of the case on an ongoing basis, as was ordered in the matter of communication components antenna versus ACE technology, by Justice Pradivar Singh. By following any of the above approaches, the plaintiff would be able to see the tangible benefits he can receive from the final outcome of the case, or as I would say, the light at the end of the tunnel, which would push the plaintiff to expedite the prosecution of the case, rather than being satisfied with the interim relief obtained. Of course, this expedition from the plaintiff's side would be visible only if the plaintiff is confident that it would succeed at the end of the trial. Since the defendant would be out of pocket for a portion of its sale proceeds from infringing products, not just from future sales, but even for past sales, the defendant itself would expedite the prosecution of the case as well. Again, this expedition would be visible from the defendant's side, only if the defendant is reasonably confident that it would succeed at the end of the trial. Such arrangements could accomplish, which even the grant of or rejection of an injunction may not accomplish in given circumstances as they balance the equities in the best possible manner at the interim stage and have the potential of promoting an expeditious final disposal of the case. In case the plaintiff is seen to be delaying the case, the percentage of sale proceeds ordered to be deposited could be ordered to be reduced or even lifted to altogether. In case the defendant is seen to be delaying the case, the percentage of the sale proceeds ordered to be deposited could be ordered to be increased. In some cases, the defendant could even be ordered to be restrained from selling the infringing products if it is seen to be delaying. In other words, the direction to deposit can be kept fluid. That means subject to increase or decrease based on the prosecution of the case by the party. This way, both the parties are kept in the game and both parties have an incentive to expeditiously seek adjudication of the matter, a result that is consistent with the very objective of commercial courts. Again, of course, all these approaches would depend on facts of each case and no blanket or cast iron formula can be laid down. As regards the grant of damages, I would want to address the way the court should appreciate the evidence led by the parties on damages. For this, one has to take recourse to basic principles of proofs of fact under the Indian law, such as burden of proof, 
shifting of onus and the balance of probabilities standard in civil cases. There are a few ways in which courts could approach the evidence led by the plaintiff patentee. One could be an objective approach where the plaintiff patentee is asked to prove his case for damages to the objective satisfaction of the court. But the second could be a subjective approach where the plaintiff patentee is asked to prove his case for damages to the subject, subjective satisfaction of the court. In the former, when the plaintiff is called upon to satisfy the objective satisfaction of the court, the court would compare objectively the evidence led by the plaintiff and the rebuttal evidence led by the defendant and take judicial notice of how the witness stood up to cross-examination. In the latter, when the plaintiff is called upon to satisfy the subjective satisfaction of the court, the court would judicially apply its mind and view the evidence led by the plaintiff regardless of the rebuttal evidence led by the defendant and regardless of whether the defendant was able to break the plaintiff's witness in cross-examination or whether the defendant led its own evidence to rebut the case presented by the plaintiff. The answer to this question is not simple as it may look. While the courts are expected to view the comparative strength of the evidence led by the parties and therefore the objective test laid above is judicially acceptable, one could argue that the court's conscience must be subjectively satisfied, notwithstanding what rebuttal evidence or what cross-examination has come forward from the defendant's side. This would therefore require the subjective satisfaction of the court to be brought into play. Therefore, the question is, is the judiciary empowered to exercise its own subjective interpretation to the evidence led by the plaintiff, or should the court simply accept the evidence of the plaintiff if the same stands non-traversed? A similar question arose in the United States of America in the case of Ironworks Patent versus Apple, reported at 255 F Supplementary 3rd D 530. In this case concerning patent infringement, while the patentee had led evidence to quantify its claim for damages, the infringer chose not to lead any evidence on damages. However, the jury decided not to accept the quantification of the patentee and rather applied its own mind to the factual issue of quantification of damages. The Court of Appeals rejected this approach of the jury and held that when the infringer does not offer any alternate assessment or computation of damages, the court must award damages based on the assessment and computation of the patentee that is supported by evidence. Although this, court, uh, although this case went up in appeal, but the same was dismissed on grounds of mutual settlement. In another case de decided in the United States titled Peter versus the Berlin Corporation, the Court of Appeals held that when no contrary evidence exists in record, all assertions that the testimony is self-serving and defies common sense cannot form a basis on which this court could engage in the normal inappropriate process of substituting a contrary credibility determination for that of the district court. I have in Phillips versus Amaze store, after considering Rooks versus Barnard and Castle versus Broom judgments of the UK court, Try to lay down a formula for computation of damages in a trademark matter. Could I have that slide, please? Phillips. In this case, I pointed out that in case it's the first time innocent infringer, an injunction would lie, simple. Second, if there's a first time knowing infringer, it would be injunction plus partial costs. Repeated knowing infringer, which causes minor impact to the plaintiff, it would be injunction plus cost plus partial damages. It was a case of repeat, a repeated knowing infringer, which causes major impact to the plaintiff, it would be injunction plus cost plus compensatory damages. If the infringement was deliberate, calculated, willful contempt of court, then it would be injunction plus cost plus aggravated damages, which would be compensatory plus additional damages. The same principle can be considered even in a patent matter. However, this issue requires a wider debate. To conclude, patent litigation is an emerging field and the principles which are to apply with regard to this field of litigation are yet to fully crystallize in India. I am sure this debate and discussion would help in crystallizing and formalizing the principles. Thank you very much. Mr. Sadan, could you please unmute yourself? Mr. Sadan, could you please unmute yourself? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Justice Manmohan, for that uh, interesting uh, discussion on the topic of today's webinar. Indeed, the approaches that you have identified are a practical reality that we must be prepared for as patent litigators. 
we must understand that the interim relief is but the battle and the war is yet to be fought <laughs> and as a matter of fact you know the the approaches that you have identified answers many questions that we have received at the time of registration and the concerns of many practitioners and clients about how to deal with delays in patent litigations also sir the objective approach that you have elucidated for appreciation of evidence has seemed to be the judicial trend and perhaps is the way forward whatever be the quantum of damages sir which have been claimed by the plaintiff a consistent approach ought to be adopted to bring certainty to the system the rules of appreciation of evidence should be consistent notwithstanding the damages claimed being in a few lakhs or running into a hundreds of crores just as the rules of leg before wicket in cricket are the same notwithstanding the batsman being ishan sharma or a sachin tendulkar it is time that patents in india are seen not just as a monopolization tool but also as a monetization tool with that i would like now now like to invite mr pashnanda to offer his views on today's topic of discussion thank you sidan um, i am grateful to honorable justice manmohan for such a uh, illuminating overview of the issues involved uh, in matters relating to patent litigation particularly with respect to um, the scope of injunctive remedies and and damages uh, in my own uh, presentation i wanted to talk a bit about uh, the issues that arise uh, and consideration and challenges that we face in matters relating to uh, calculation award of damages in patent litigation um, as honorable justice manmohan just pointed out that the scope of injunctive remedy if we if we um, go beyond the two extremes either cases where injunctive remedy obviously will result and and those cases where it is unlikely to result th there is a vast majority of cases where there are competing claims of both sides very persuasive and the court is not in a position to conduct a mini trial and go into uh, you know in great detail in technical aspects it is in those situations keeping the final outcome in mind which is the award of monetary damages that um, that courts generally and i think delhi high court in particular in india have there are several cases where they have worked out very innovative ad hoc arrangements that balance the equities and the interests of uh, both parties um but as you said uh, in, in the, the 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 case for an injunction is really um, a battle the real war is about damages and when it comes to damages i think uh, indian law indian law when it comes to patent lit uh, litigation provides for two alternative schemes uh, in terms of monetary compensation uh, section 108 gives an option to the to the to the patentee to either sue for rendition of accounts or account for profits or to sue for damages um, rendition of account of or account of profits is really uh, jurisprudentially and in terms of uh, the legal basis of that claim is really um, a claim for profits made by the infringer infringer and in making that kind of a claim it is immaterial whether the patenty himself for itself would have been able to make those profits or not it is essentially a claim which simply says you stole uh, something on which i have had a right and you made money on that thing and i and i all that money should should be passed on to me so your profits should be passed on to me um it is in essence not really uh, the equivalent of compensatory damages it is in essence a claim for recovery of wrongful gains made by somebody else on account of Uh, my intellectual property um, we see in delhi high court and in bombay high court in fact most commercial courts routinely uh, award that kind of remedy uh, in shogun organics limited recently the delhi high court uh, made an award of uh, uh, based on account of profits uh, as a percentage of total sales uh, generally speaking an account of profits is um, is really the profit made by the infringer and that is the scheme um, but when we come to uh, a claim for damages then jurisprudentially a claim for damages is really um uh, in 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 the sense of what what the patentee has been deprived of so it is really a claim for profits that the patentee would have made if the infringement had not taken place um 
it is i in in my experience as a counsel i think to prove uh, an account for account for profits or to keep, succeed in a claim for account for profits is relatively easier provided you do not have a very disruptive and uncooperative defendant uh, because it all emanates from the records of the defendant and the, and the evidence that the defendant is likely to produce before the court a claim for damages on the other hand is uh, is where basically it's a very broad clean canvas and 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 there is a lot more that has to be done by by the plaintiff in order to demonstrate that something more than just an account for profits would be really proper compensation uh, if you look at the delhi high court judgment in indian performing rights society versus devashish patnaik uh, it recognizes and i will come to some other judgments the principles that are recognized uh, when when a patent makes a claim for damages is really that that a patentee has to be compensated for losses that it has suffered but for the you know on account of the infringement and the and the and the money that it would have made but for the infringement so that would include claims in the nature of taking away or reducing or diminution of the claim of the patentee's business uh, adversely impacting the patentee's business adversely impacting the growth of the patentee's business as a matter of fact even um a one act of infringement can open the doors for several subsequent infringements so really it has it may have a cascading effect in in most cases um while you know analytically that 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 appears to uh, appeal to us that that is the manner in which a patent you ought to be compensated the fact is that, that the consideration of proof of all these facts are quite elaborate and involve uh, you know several issues that would require to be of course in in this kind of an analysis for damages it is immaterial as to what really the the infringer has made it is really i mean the, the patentee's loss has nothing to do with the infringer's gain infringer may have tried to make 100 rupees he might have ended up making only 1 rupee but the loss that the patentee has suffered might be equivalent to 1000 rupees um those are broadly the, the principles for damages um compensatory damages as, as i would call them uh, they would fall within this scheme and then there is a scheme for aggravated damages which we now see being recognized by courts a lot more in in in, in intellectual property litigation in trademark litigation in patent litigation i will come to punitive damages or aggravated damages in the end but let me talk a bit more about compensatory damages um in in matters relating to patent litigation at the threshold let me tell you that there is of course as i said account for profits is an easier sort of uh, uh, threshold to cross compared to you know compensatory damages there is something midway i think and which is a, a reasonable royalty uh, award um, a reasonable royalty really in in its nature is a percentage of what the infringer has made but really it is compensatory in nature it is not so much an account for profits it is compensatory in nature and that kind of a remedy would be ideal where uh, based on the evidence before the court it is visible that the license that the patentee was a willing licensor there is a market for this kind of a license and had the license you really had the infringer really taken a license it would have had to pay an x amount of money as a royalty um a reasonable royalty award is basically in in my assessment is the is perhaps the barest minimum that a successful patentee in an action for infringement would be entitled to but as i said earlier compensatory damages can take uh, various other forms and take into account several other aspects including as i said loss of business and and cascading effect in damaging uh, a business it comes i want to talk a bit about calculation of compensatory damages of course i mean general principles of award of damages they have to be direct they have to be foreseeable they ought not to be excluded by principles of public policy we have you know i'm i'm i quite like following the exposition of law in gaber government the uk court of appeal judgment where these issues are discussed quite in detail um, in matters relating to patent infringement my own view is that um, that the issue of foreseeability is perhaps not that high a threshold to cross for a successful patenty um, and i think once the i mean once infringement is proved and often in the process of proof of infringement the entire gamut or the manner in which infringement 
did take place, I think would in most cases uh, discharge the burden of proving a certain degree of foreseeability. And I think in, in generally in IP disputes and IP infringement cases, and in patent litigation specifically, I think it should really be for the defendant infringer to prove that, that the damages that he's been asked to pay were not foreseeable by the plaintiff. Uh, beyond, I'm not saying that the, that the burden entirely should be on the defendant, but I believe that the burden should be, should be lower for the plaintiff to cross and the owner should then move on to the defendant to prove the other way around uh, in a case of proven infringement. Um, when it comes to quantification of damages, um, we can either simply, I mean, courts can courts follow two approaches in India. We, they either simply look at the business gained by the infringer because of the infringing activity. As I mentioned earlier, if you adopt that approach, then the simplest way of calculating what is payable would be an account of profits. But that, as I said, is not compensatory damages. That is an alternate method of, uh, of compensation. The compensatory damages, if you still look at um, 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 at, at loss of business suffered by the patentee, but a loss of business that has translated into certain income uh, uh, gained by the, by the infringer, uh, may, in such cases, it may be possible to, for example, look beyond a simple award of uh, account for profits, um, but look at the evidence that the plaintiff has produced in terms of what the plaintiff would have made, the patentee would have made in case of that business. So there's a judgment of a learned single judge in Sterlite Technologies where it has been noticed that often the percentage of profits that an infringer has made is much less than the percentage of profits that the patentee itself would have made. Often the, 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 the price of the goods, infringing goods that the infringer is selling at is much lower than what the patentee would have sold at. So these are aspects that can be looked into and instead of an award of account for profits, um, it is possible for courts to make, a, make an award of compensatory damages based on the profit percentage that the plaintiff has proved. For example, infringer makes 5% profit on a, on a good sold for 100 rupees, but really plaintiff has demonstrated that it would have sold that product for 200 rupees and would have made 30 rupees as profit. So uh, would it be possible for, to, for, for the court to award 30% of 100 rupees against the infringer? Profit percentage that the patentee has lost on the goods that the infringer has sold. Um, and those are, those are sort of innov innovative options that are considered. Uh, in IPRS judgment that I mentioned earlier, the Delhi High Court uh, said this very clearly that we don't really have to look at always at the infringer's gain, it is really the loss concept that has to be has to be looked at. Um, uh, there may be alternative cases where it is not possible to link the loss suffered by the patentee at all with the business gained by the infringer, or it might be impossible to prove whether the infringer has made any business or has made any profit. And then there may be cases where the infringer has carried out an infringement damage the patentee, but really has not made substantial profits. How do you compensate the, the patentee in those cases? Um, so that is a hypothetical reconstruction of market kind of concept where based on several assumptions, and it is not just guesswork, several assumptions, highly technical in nature, um, um, the impact of one infringement having a cascading effect, all these issues often with the help of uh, market project projections and expert evidence are proved to the satisfaction of the court. Um, the Indian Supreme Court has held in several cases, particularly if you see Burn Standard, that in the case of a breach of this nature, when you're awarding damages, uh, all possible assumptions have to be taken in favor of the party that is injured. Um, in, the, in, in, this, in this exercise, the, the, the US Supreme Court has held in story parchment that the risk of uncertainty, of uncertainty should also go, go to the, uh, should be borne by the infringer and the benefit should go to the injured party. So in such cases, while it's an assumption and a, and a hypothetical exercise uh, with some facts that are capable of proof, but all possible assumptions should go to the benefit of, uh, of the PTNT. If you look at, I mean, there is, however, something that will be of great significance. Uh, you make all these assumptions for a relevant period, but you notice that there are certain current mar market fluctuations that you cannot disregard. So for example, if you were looking at a claim for damages, 
in today's period. And that claim, when you had filed the affidavit of your expert witness one year ago, was based on several assumptions. But but do you disregard the impact of COVID on the market while actually awarding a claim? So obviously, if you look at the Supreme Court, UK Supreme Court judgment in Bunch, uh, uh, the view expressed by um, uh, Lord Sumption, that in such a case of even hypothetical reconstruction of market or you know, calculation of damages generally, the real market conditions cannot really be ignored uh, if they would have had an impact on actual loss that you're trying to claim. Um, generally speaking, Indian courts would, in appropriate cases, even um, adopt a broad, broad brush, rough and ready estimate kind of approach. If you look at the division bench judgment in Delhi High Court in Hindustan, uh, the court really, after, in a case of uh, disparaging advertisements, the court really looked at the amount of money spent by the, the, advertise, the disparaging advertiser and then reached a broad brush estimate of, of awarding 20 lakh rupees as compensatory damages. Um, uh, it's very interesting because while, while expressly this subjective approach that Honorable Justice Manmohan mentioned to is not the term used in, in Hindustan Unilever. But I feel that the tendency of Indian courts to adopt this broad brush approach or rough and ready approach is, is something that is perhaps the tipping point from where the subjective uh, calculation of jam damages or the subjective approach of courts uh, will, will, will really uh, take off. And eventually, I think the jurisprudence will be relevant. I will now come to the last point that in addition to compensatory damages, um, Indian courts would generally in intellectual property litigation and in patent litigation make an award of punitive damages as well. But in cases where there is uh, some element of uh, aggravated injury, some element of conspiracy um, or, or planned damage or planned, you know, in the nature of theft, those are the cases where courts, in, in the Indian courts have routinely recognized principles of punitive damages. Um, in Hindustan Unilever, uh, punitive damages were recognized. The principle was that you, that you cannot really award punitive damages in the absence of an award of compensatory damages, but because punitive damages must follow compensatory damages. But as Honorable Justice Manmohan then later on held in his own judgment in um, Conic Light Phillips, that it is really, you're making an overall award of damages and punitive damages can be a component rather than an independent head of damages. And that principle is recognized in Indian law. Um, and I, you would see that often um, an, a claim of two times the amount of compensatory damages is not surprising in, in Indian courts in appropriate cases of aggravated loss. And which is, which is also quite consistent with US jurisprudence that a total amount of three times uh, of the comp compensatory. So if one third, if one rupee is the compensatory damages, then you're awarding two rupees you'll add as punitive damages and it's overall three times of the compensatory damages. Um, that is, those are the broad principles of, of um, award of compensation that we see in intellectual property litigation, specifically in the context of uh, patent litigation in, in courts in India. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, sir. I think that was extremely illuminating with respect to the kind of damages and how to calculate those damages that you give an overview about. And I think it is in line with the general principles of tortious wrong that the infringers need not be the patentee's loss. And although at first blush it may be sort of unreasonable, but if I come to think of it, if I, if I bang my car into my neighbor's wall, I may have caused my neighbor damage of his wall, but I have got, gained nothing. So it is a similar concept where the defendant has fractured my monopoly right by introducing infringing products. He may or may not have made any money out of fracturing my monopoly, but because my monopoly has been fractured and irretrievably per perhaps so, I am entitled to the damage that I have as a plaintiff incurred, notwithstanding what damages, what, what gains the defendant has made in that process. And I think that is that after your uh, speech, it seems quite reasonable and perhaps the way forward in such litigations. And I also noticed that the, the concept of the infringer's gain need not being the plaintiff's loss is also discussed in the case of Castle versus Broom, which Justice Manmohan referred to. Uh, while uh, deciding the case of uh, Amazon and uh, Amazto. And so therefore there is clearly a line of jurisprudence both in the US and in the UK, 
which proceeds on the line that in patent infringement matters, the defendant's gain is immaterial. It is the plaintiff's loss that must be compensated. He must be restituted to the same position, but for the infringing acts. With this, if I could now invite uh, Mr. Jeffrey Chapman to offer his views on today's topic, and especially in the context of the very recent judgment in Nurem versus Mylan that just came two weeks back. Over to you, Mr. Chapman. Thank you. Good afternoon, my lord, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor, a pleasure, and a delight to come in at number three in such a formidable batting lineup. I'm unworthy of such a promotion, but I will do my best to provide, at the very least, an entertaining cameo of an innings. I have some slides because, of course, I have a good face for radio, and I'm now going to try and uh, put those onto the screen. I hope that's worked. Uh, I'm going to talk today about damages in the patents court in England. I have two aspects to the presentation. Uh, firstly, damages inquiries to establish the loss suffered by a party who has been injuncted where the injunction is subsequently discharged as having been wrongly granted, uh, inquiries as to damages on cross undertakings. And secondly, uh, damages claimed by the owner of a patent seeking an interim injunction assessed according to the usual rules applicable to claims in tort. Uh, so far as the first aspect is concerned, uh, damages inquiries, I was I had the pleasure of representing Sandos in uh, the largest ever claim for equitable compensation or damages arising out of a patent last year in a case called, as you can see there, uh, it was the Court of Appeal decision in um, Sandos and uh, Knapp. The, that case uh, resulted in a 21 day trial and 21 days of my life that I will never get back. I had to cross examine something like 32 factual witnesses and three of the six experts in that period. The case settled on confidential terms before judgment, counsel having done all the work, including closing the case for four days and summarizing all of the evidence that we'd seen. There were something like 80 lever arch files uh, a plethora of material. I think it's fair to say I'm only now getting over it. Um, however, that damage inquiry has got some practical lessons which uh, may be of interest in how one goes about proving loss that's been caused by an injunction. So that's the first matter I'll talk about. The second matter is uh, the Neurim decision, which uh, I mentioned uh, in the first slide, Neurim Pharmaceuticals, and Generics UK Limited, which is literally the most exciting decision in the Patents Court in England in the last 12 months. Uh, I know that's a very high bar. Mr. Justice Marcus Smith, who is formerly uh, a barrister at Fountain Court and not a patent specialist, has given a decision on the 3rd of June 2020, which caused such excitement at the patent bar that it was rushed into the Court of Appeal and heard by the Court of Appeal on Thursday, so two days ago, and we don't yet know the outcome of the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal was, however, uh, three, three judges, two of them, Lord Justice Floyd and Lord Justice Arnold, whose names I'm sure you will recognise as doyons of the patent bar, and it's fair to say that uh, many people's one pound would be betting on the status quo being restored and Mr Justice Marcus Smith's judgment being overturned but we will see. Uh, anyway I'll come on to that I'll talk first of all about um, inquiries into damages. Uh, last year's case the, the Sandos and Knapp case involved buprenorphine seven-day patches BP7 which are an opioid patch they're category C in the English drug tariff, which is important in that they have to be prescribed by brand. 
And the effect of that, and why it's important, is that when a generic was about to be launched by Sandos, Relatrans, at 30% below the um, list price of the originator product, uh, that would have led to a price fall, but it wouldn't have led to a price crash. And I'm sure you'll all be familiar, and I'll come on to it later, with the, the downward spiral effect, which is often caused by the introduction of generics. Uh, for special reasons due to um, the necessity for safety concerns that opioids are prescribed by brand, there wasn't a price crash in this case. And that meant, as I'm sure you will have uh, immediately uh, realized, that there was far more money in play than there would be in a case where there would, there would be a price crash because of the introduction of generics. And the claim in uh, Sandos for the injunction was um, something over a hundred million pounds, even though the injunction was only granted on the 22nd of February 2016. And after a speedy trial in which it was held, there was no infringement of the patent. There was then a, a swift appeal and the injunction was finally discharged on the 2nd of August 2016. So the new product was only kept off the market for a period of just under six months. Um, Notwithstanding that, and this is uh, often an issue in damages inquiries, uh, the, um, the Sandos case was that by being kept out of the market for almost six months, they lost first generic mover advantage and it gave the incumbent originator, NAP, the chance to establish its own generic, Butec, as a generic in the market, the leading generic in the market, and by the time Sandos came to market in August 2016, it had effectively been stitched up with those uh, health authorities who were most likely to switch to a generic brand in order to save money, having already switched. And Relatrans, therefore, rather, having, rather than having a barnstorming launch and becoming an extremely profitable product, had a much less impressive launch and ended up with a much smaller market share than it said or what it hoped it would get. So that led, therefore, to a Relatrans claim, which essentially was based on uh, a hypothetical scenario. And um, as you will know, the principle, you may well know, the principles in England for an inquiry uh, into damage caused by an injunction that's wrongfully granted were set out in the Apotex case. And essentially, the law says that the court has to work out what would have happened if the injunction had not been granted. And so we're into the world of counterfactuals. We had to turn the clock back to February 2016 and try to work out what the most likely outcome would have been had Relatrans been able to launch in February 2016 rather than August 2016. And the Sandos case was, it was no use looking at August 2016 to see what would have happened in February 2016 because by August 2016, the market had, in vernacular terms, been stitched up by the incumbent, which had used the six months of the injunction to switch uh, health authorities who were using the originator product to the generic, to its own generic product. Uh, and that led to really a massive fight. Uh, I was brought into the case as a commercial litigator because uh, the patent lawyers, who are extremely clever and had worked out why the Sandos patent was a workaround and didn't infringe the NAP patent, uh, took the view that, frankly, 20, 25 day inquiries were not what they were really interested in doing. And cross-examining multiple witnesses uh, was also not something that normally goes on in the, uh, in the patents court. And so commercial, uh, a commercial silk, me, commercial junior, and a patent team of solicitors took the case forward to trial. The practical lessons we learned, uh, the case having settled and therefore I'm not able to read you out a reasoned judgment of Mr Justice Morgan explaining what he thought of it all, was that it's if you are trying to prove a large claim for damages, then you need to produce compelling documentation from your client seeking the damages showing with a considerable degree of confidence what it is they say they would have achieved. 
and that would include robust contemporaneous forecasts showing what uh, Sandoz thought that they were going to achieve, um, proper launch documentation, witness evidence from the sales force showing what they would have done, evidence about the manufacturing capacity, uh, a, a major point if you are claiming that you would have sold huge quantities of a product then you need to be able to prove that you could have manufactured huge quantities of the product if you're going to claim loss of profits for the lost sales. Um, we had, but in principle one would need to have, uh, evidence of what happened during the injunction period, including reports up to board level. And in an ideal world, not necessarily the world we were in, litigation lawyers would have been involved from the time when the injunction was granted with a view to looking forward to try and win the inquiry. Because it's all very well getting the injunction discharged, but if you then only uh, obtain a very small amount of compensation, that may not put you in the position you would have been in if the injunction hadn't been granted in the first place, because you need to persuade a court that that's what it should do. So those are some practical tips. Uh, in, in many cases, of course, the, um, uh, the damages will be agreed, they'll be in a much smaller number, but there are cases such as uh, the Sandoz case where the sums in question are sufficiently large that a commercial kind of trial will be necessary in order to prove the loss that's been suffered. So that's inquiries into damages. The second thing, the second subject I wanted to talk about was the Neurim uh, Pharmaceuticals case which was a claim for an injunction to prevent the launch of a generic form of circadin, which is a drug to improve the quality of sleep. Uh, the hearing was, the hearing took place at first instance on the 3rd of June, I think a couple of weeks ago, and an expedited trial to see whether the patent was infringing or not had already been fixed for October this year. The Traditional test for injunctions, which I, um, I understand from my law's presentation is similar in India, is um, you need to establish, first of all, whether there's a serious issue to be tried, which in pretty much every patents case is not going to take very long. Um, there always will be one. The second question is, are damages an adequate remedy for the claimant? So it, can the holder of the patent be adequately compensated in damages? If not, is the cross undertaking in damages sufficient for the defendant? And if there's doubt, what's the balance of convenience? And the, the position in England for many years has been that the courts have been very keen to protect uh, the originators, the holders of the patent, and where generic case, generic drugs have been uh, launched and there's been a claim that the generic infringes the originator's patent, then as Terrell, the standard textbook on patents, tells us, um, the courts have been uh, more than willing to give effect to evidence that the introduction of a generic will have an irreversible downward spiral effect on price, which means that it's going to be very difficult to calculate the damages that an originator might suffer because once the price goes down, it's very difficult, if not impossible, to put it back up again. And therefore the courts have erred on the side of giving injunctions against generics. And uh, that, that view has been the practice in the patents court for a number of years now, uh, but it was challenged in Norium, and it was challenged in front of a judge who is not from the patents bar, but is more uh, like me, used to the commercial court way of doing things and more familiar with the traditional American cyanamide uh, approach. And in his judgment, which is uh, as ever remarkably clear and cogent, Mr. Justice Marcus Smith uh, explains that the calculation of damages in patent cases is no different from the calculation of damages in any other tortious case. It could be done in this case and indeed where you have an established product, it's going to be much easier to tell what the market share is that it loses 
as a result of the introduction of a generic, then trying to do the exercise the other way around and giving an injunction and then trying to predict what impact the generic would have had on the market in the counterfactual. And from a practical point of view, I have to say there is a considerable amount in that. When you are arguing before a court, as we were three years after the injunction was given in the Sandos and Knapp case, and you're trying to turn the clock back to February 2016, at a time when there was no injunction, and ask the court to assume that nothing that actually happened after February 2016 actually happened, that's extremely difficult to do. Judges, perhaps unsurprisingly, do look to the real world for guidance. And they say things such as, well, we can see what happened in August 2016. Why wouldn't that have happened in February 2016? And I think in Neurim, the, uh, the court's approach was really to think about what that exercise would involve and say, do you know what? It's going to be much easier to work out what loss has been caused to the incumbent the person with the product already on the market than the loss that will be caused to the person who's going to come onto the market. And we can work out, the court will in due course be able to work out if the injunction has, uh, it should have been granted but wasn't, the court will be able to work out what effect the, uh, the fall in the market price will have. Here that the, um, it's important to note, oops, I went too far, important to note that the patent was due to expire in August 2022. So the, uh, the time going forward that you had to calculate the loss is not that long. It's only um, just over two years. And the court's reasoning was that the projections were far more uncertain for the new entrant than they were for the originator. Difficult to quantify the advantage, as this slide says, of being the generic first mover. Obviously, that uh, as in the, the Sandos case, being the first generic on the market gives you the opportunity to establish market share. And it's difficult to predict how that will turn out if you don't actually do it. And much easier to observe the effect of the generic launch on the claimant's established product. Which meant that the, uh, the court concluded that damages would be an adequate remedy for the originator and therefore you didn't need to get to the balance of convenience. If damages are an adequate remedy, then no injunction should be granted. Mr. Justice Marcus Smith um, dismissed the, the injunction application in the nicest possible way. Uh, I believe he gave permission to go to the Court of Appeal. And as I say, we are all now waiting with bated breath to see what the Court of Appeal is going to say. And so there we are. Two aspects of damages from the English courts, both of them in fact connected and it's quite easy to see that the principles by which one assesses damages in a normal tortious case need to be applied to the special instances which occur of patent infringements but they are still the same general principles. Large cases involve more factual issues than small cases but the legal principles underlying them are the same. And that is all I would like to say on the subject. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chapman. I think ex what you have mentioned today is something which really throws light upon how damages ought to be calculated even in an Indian scenario. Of course, the one comment I thought I should make is that eventually if neurons claim for damages is going to be tested. Of course, because it is going to be a hypothetical reconstruction of the market, as Mr. Pashnanda had also stated a few minutes back. Any doubts in the computation, any doubts in the hypothetical reconstruction, because it is all in the would have hemisphere, should be resolved in favor of the patentee. For otherwise, you are not only denying him an injunction, but also putting a very strict test of a hypothetical reconstruction of market which may not be accepted by the court just because it is hypothetical in nature. So perhaps the, the connected test is to always resolve any doubts in favor of the patentee and throw the onus on the defendant to disprove the quantification calculation given by the plaintiff. And I also noticed, you know, that how 
foreseeability again, which Mr. Pashtanda had mentioned during his discussion, is again a given factor in an infringement suit because of the facts and because of the nature of a, a patent litigation, where there is a patent in a jurisdiction, it is being infringed in that jurisdiction, of course, it would cause damage. Of course, the infringer knows that if it is found to be infringing, it will have to pay up damages. And therefore, the only question that remains is of quantification and calculation. Now, that brings me to a very interesting point of discussion. And so, Justin Manmohan, I would like to throw you a question. In the UK, under the American Sinomid test, there is a concept of giving a cross undertaking where the plaintiff can be asked to provide an undertaking that if it is found that the injunction granted to the plaintiff at the interim stage was wrongly granted, then the defendant would be li liable to be compensated for all damages flowing from the wrongful injunction granted at the interim stage. Now, my question is, is it permissible under the Indian legal system for a defendant in a patent infringement suit to claim damages from the plaintiff on account of an injunction that is granted against the defendant at the interim stage, but is eventually discharged after trial. So if you could have some views on you on that from you, sir. Yeah, in my view, most certainly. See, we follow the concept of restitution. We also believe that uh, no party will be prejudiced by an act of the court. And it would be the endeavor of the court to ensure that a party who has suffered on account of its decision which is finally reversed, should be put back in the same position as far as practicable in which he would have if the decision adverse to him had not been passed. And that principle has been followed consistently by the Supreme Court, whether it's uh, Kavita Trayan versus Balsara Hygiene or it is Kerala State Electricity Board versus MRF. We have, we have a kitina of judgments on restitution. In fact, there's a specific provision in the CPC on that score. And we've been following it. Only issue is the defendant normally doesn't exercise that that power or or that liberty which he has doesn't uh, press upon for this relief. If it is pressed for, it will have to be granted in my view. And that is settled law, I think. Yeah. Sir, would that also mean that the courts can start looking at uh, asking patentees to put in bank guarantees for in in return for issuing interim injunctions, as defendants are asked to do so? It would depend on the strength and the weakness of the case. It can't be a cast iron formula, you know. You'll have to see. Suppose there is a certificate of validity given in a previous litigation, then certainly you will not ask for a cross undertaking. Right. But if you feel that the defendant has also made out a prime fisheye case for revocation, then, then you would certainly, or a counterclaim is properly made out, then you would certainly ask for cross undertaking if required. But that the bar will also have to move appropriate applications and and this point will have to be urged uh, with full uh, gutso in a proper case. That's, that's the issue. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So my next question to Honorable Justice Manmohan is that whether the concept of dynamic injunctions, which you have laid down in the UTV case, can be extended to infringing products that are introduced by the defendant in the market after the grant of an interim relief in favor of the plaintiff. And these new infringing products have the same functionality as the infringing products that form part of the originally uh, framed suit. And they have been introduced in the market only to circumvent the interim relief. So what in this case, sir, I mean, because dynamic injunctions as a concept, which was introduced by you was in the context of a defendant changing its own identity. But what if the defendant is to change the identity of the infringing product without changing its functionality per se? How would you sir, look at that in the context of dynamic injunctions, especially given that the plaintiff cannot be expected to keep amending the plaint to keep introducing fresh products into the plaint? So how, what, what, what are your views on that, sir? See, prior fish I would say, why not? Uh, but this would certainly require an in-depth examination. Uh, and the facts of the case would have to be seen. Uh, if you just uh, show my slide on that uh, UTV, which I had prepared, just one paragraph I had culled out uh, from the dynamic injunction. If uh, 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 Mohit, you could show that. I think you had it. See, I said dynamic injunction orders can be passed against Hydra headed rogue websites who are being blocked, actually multiply and resurface as redirect or mirror or alphanumeric websites. 
dynamic injunctions mean block additional domain names urls and or ip addresses that provide access to the same websites which are the subject of the main injunction therefore the dynamic injunction merely blocks new means of accessing the same infringing website for instance if if the injunction is passed against torrent and the resurface is torrent a or torrent 1 or torrent 1 2 3 then certainly the injunction you don't need to file a substantive suit all over again because you are providing access to the same infringing website that the same defendant launches a uh, a product which has the same functionality but by a different model number certainly you can amend the plaint and incorporate that but that would really depend on the facts of each case and would have to uh, be examined in length in depth on this issue yes Mr. Sudan, please unmute yourself. Mute, unmute. Sorry, one more very interesting question, sir, for Justice Manmohan. I mean, we're getting a lot of questions, sir, for you. <laughs> uh, yes. Which is being asked is that should parties be permitted to file additional documents which are intended to quantify damages along with their evidence affidavits? And if yes, should the standard of scrutiny for such documents be less stringent as compared to the standard of filing additional documents? intended to establish liability no i think the standard of standard would be the same why should the standards vary uh, standard of proof should be the same it can't vary to my mind so the standard uh, of permitting a document to be brought on record because there may be situations where your damages computation only comes in at a later stage you may not have computed your damages at the time of filing the suit so at the time of filing the evidence affidavits perhaps you need expert evidence you may be required to rely upon certain additional documents that were not filed initially you'll have to take leave of the court and make that case yes yes see it's easier said than done unless until that case is made out it will be difficult to entertain because don't forget our rules today are very very stringent yes sir. we have worked very hard on the 2018 rules and the intent was to expedite the trial and to ensure that no adjournment takes place and therefore a, a cast iron formula was laid down that no documents beyond a certain stage yes. you will not accept them so you really can't say that we now should go back on them because then the trials will go haywire and uh, this is really a very strict formula that we have laid down and we hope that the bar will abide by it but if you make out a good case certainly liberty can be granted at some cost but normally speaking it should not be granted because then the whole process of trial would get delayed right sir so my next question would be for mr pachnanda sir when you mention about foreseeability causation in the context of damages so what would be your view that if there are multiple infringers of a suit patent in the market can a plaintiff claim its entire loss from any one of the infringers rather than having to sue and claim damages from all the infringers so whether you would be entitled as a matter of law to obtain all your losses from any one infringer or would you have to apportion and only that amount of damages which have been caused by that particular defendant can be uh, obtained from a by a plaintiff i think sir is just having some issues in uh, unmuting himself uh, okay am i audible am yes. i audible now yes. i'm so sorry so siddhant i think uh, when it comes to joint tort feasors whether they are concurrent tort feasors or consecutive tort feasors in the sense that whether there are simultaneous acts causing injury or whether there are consecutive separate acts causing injury i think the broad principle would be um, whether they result in the same damage or, or, or they cause the same kind of loss and in cases of same damage they they, they would be jointly and separately liable uh, liable so it would be open for the patentee to recover his entire damage for any one from any one of them subject to the broad rule that if he has recovered if any part of it from the other joint tort feasor then that has to be accounted for in the overall claim against this one 
um, I think that would be the broad principle that I, I, I can think of. Of course, uh, in case of several tort feasors uh, where, uh, where they are causing different damage, then the, the very liability would be separate. So there's no question of joint or separate liability. But joint tort feasors resulting in the same damage, um, they'd be jointly and separately liable. Right, sir. Right. Thank you so much for that, sir. So, just a uh, Mr. Kaplan, what would be your views uh, under UK law on that position? On, on being able to recover the entire damage from one infringer rather than having to go and sue all the infringers? Yes. Is that is a short answer? Yes, you can. There's no difference so far as Indian law and English law is concerned. You can, it, it's, it, you're looking for the um, the infringer who would have the wherewithal to pay the damages that you're seeking, but where the tort feeds as a jointly and several liable, then then you can recover the damage from uh, from all of them. Um, there may be there may be difficulties where the infringers have different products, and where you're saying the loss caused by one product is different from the loss caused by another product, but in principle. All of the loss you've suffered is recoverable. Right. Mr. Chapman, my next question is again uh, to you. Is a plaintiff who has obtained an interim injunction capable of also claiming damages from the defendant as a result of the irreparable spiral effect that the pre injunction activities of the defendant have had on the pricing of products by the plaintiff? subject to the mitigating effect that the injunction may have had? Again, a short answer, yes. Uh, a longer answer, uh, it, it's, it's always open to an originator to claim damages as well as an injunction. In the English pharmaceutical market, because of the need to obtain marketing authorizations before you launch a product, the originator always has some notice of a rival product being launched on the market because it's very heavily regulated. And the, the way it works is a, a market authorization has to be obtained before a new product can be put onto the market. And the originator then has some time to write letters to the, uh, the new product, warning them that they would be in breach and seeking undertakings and then being able to uh, go to court to try and prevent the launch. There are cases, uh, and there have been cases, where the launch has just about taken place and some of the uh, inf alleged infringing pharmaceuticals have been sold, uh, where there would be small claims for damage and where also there is a price effect which takes, which comes into force, comes into play before the injunction. And in those circumstances, if it's subsequently established that the product was uh, breach of the patent, then damages would be recoverable. But uh, as I'm sure you know, there are the originated pharmaceutical companies engage highly capable uh, lawyers who spend a lot of time scrutinizing their potential rivals in order to work out when and where they need to go to court to obtain injunctive relief to try and minimize the claims for damages that will result. Because uh, we all speak as if damages are just automatic and of course it's right that a person with a patent gets uh, all sorts of um, uh, assumptions made in their favor but still litigation comes with a cost it comes with a time cost it comes with a management cost and it comes with a financial cost and it's very difficult to make yourself whole and i think patentees would rather get an injunction at an earlier stage rather than have to rely upon a damages claim which is there in principle so Justice Manmohan, what would be your view, sir, on the equity of being for a plaintiff to be capable of asking for both an injunction and damages? And having obtained an injunction, what would be the what would be the effect on his claim for damages if at all it survives? In a patent matter, normally the primary relief which a patentee seeks is injunction and damages. And uh, the experience that has been is that the life of the patent is too short for Indian standards. Say registration itself can take about five to 10 or even 12 years or 13 years. It's, it's gone that far. 
for registration. And by the time it comes to court and you go for a full trial at the appeal stage, the final hearing at the Supreme Court, the patent's life has virtually come to an end or is about to come to an end. So damages is the primary remedy which he actually presses. So injunction and damages are the two remedies which are known to the known to this branch of law. And uh, injunctions are not normally granted for the asking in patent matters, especially when a counterclaim or a plea for revocation is filed. Unlike trademark matters where normally injunction is granted for the asking if there is a registration. And the real problem in this patent law is that a patent can be challenged at all stages. <laughs> It's open to challenge at all stages. That's the beauty of this law, unlike the trademark law. So therefore, uh, damages is a remedy which can never be given up and which will have to be examined by the court. Provided the, the plaintiff has the appetite to go for a full trial and survive for so many years. That's the main challenge. Sir, sir, a question linked to what you just said, sir and especially in the context of how to prove damages. In the UK, we have a concept of split trial where liability is decided first and quantification of damages is decided thereafter. Perhaps could such a system be introduced even in the Indian legal system, especially where liability is fought, fought tooth and nail and thereafter quantification is another fight in itself. So perhaps could a split trial for patent litigation be introduced? It can be, but will it serve the ultimate purpose? Because this may lead to uh, 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 a more protracted trial, you know, when you split it into two parts. Uh, because if there is no finality to a decision, the the parties tend to then, then take the matter in appeal rather than get it resolved or accept the decision of the single judge. And... Uh, I, I, it can be done. Legally speaking, there is no bar. But the question is on the practical side. Would you like to have two trials in a matter? And what will be the cost effectiveness of that? That's the issue. So then my last question, sir, to you is, what has been the biggest challenge that you have faced while hearing a patent litigation? And what has been the single biggest consideration that has weighed in your mind while hearing a patent litigation, sir? See, as I said, the, the primary challenge is that the uh, patent is open to uh, scrutiny at all stages. Uh, that is the most fundamental thing which is there. And the other is, uh, see, the argument of public interest, which is normally urged by the defendants in all cases, that if you grant an injunction, it's the teeming millions uh, in a developing country who will be deprived of this product. Yes. That is an issue which has to be dealt with, especially in the pharmaceutical industry or even in software uh, products, you know, uh, for instance, in the telecommunications, because they say when the product becomes unviable, it will not, it will not be available to the public at large. Right. So these are the uh, uh, compelling reasons or the compelling issues which have to be determined. And the validity of the patent, you know, the time period, as I'm saying, is too short. By the time it comes to court, there's not much of time left. So one really has to juggle over there with the timing and the way the, the court dockets are placed to accommodate this and try to expedite it. Because if you expedite this, some other case has to be slowed down. So that is really the competing interest which has to be balanced. These three, four concerns are major concerns in a right. patent litigation. Right. So my, my next question is to Mr. Chapman. Uh, while, while calculating damages in UK, how, how would you apportion the amount of damages that, or the, the, the patent, how, how much has the patent contributed to, this, to the uh, availability of the infringing products in the market and to its sale in the market? and whether the non-infringing components of the product have to be apportioned in understanding what is the damage that the plaintiff can claim for this from the sale of the infringing product. Because a, a, a product may have multiple functionalities and only one of those functionalities may be patented. 
So how do you apportion the damages that has been caused by the sale of infringing products in such a case where the functionality is multiple? That's an extremely, it's an extremely good question. And it really demonstrates the fact sensitive nature of inquiries as to damages. I think the only answer I can give is it's going to depend and you're going to have evidence from experts in relation to the extent to which the patented protected part of the product was responsible for the infringing sales. And that's going to vary. And there are, there are multiple, and it's, I think that's, a, it's actually a very good reason why many of these claims do not come to court because the parties realize that the kind of question you just posed, which is excellent, is just the kind of question that's going to take days and days to resolve in front of a patents judge who's going to be sitting there scratching his or her head and listening to expert after expert giving perfectly honestly held but entirely different views <laughs> as fact is. and uh, while that evidence is uh, the judge will listen politely it's likely to be a very little assistance ultimately in enabling him to determine what the right answer is so your question is, it's a good one. It, it will undoubtedly impact the assessment of damages. The extent to which it will is going to be fact sensitive. And uh, one can only have um, pity and admiration for the member of the judiciary who will have to resolve <laughs> the matter in due course, particularly because whatever he says is going to be challenged in the Court of Appeal. I, have, I completely appreciate and understand what Justin Manmohan is feeling at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so that, in, in fact, that brings a very interesting question uh, that, Sir Justin Manmohan, is it, is it time for India to ex adopt a system for having specialized courts dealing with patent litigations such that A, it, it ex expedites the disposal of such matters, B, it has some level of technical expertise associated with it, and C, there is a, an efficacious remedy with respect to damages that the patent patentee can see, foresee to be at the end of the day. So what are your views on that, sir? So it may be a suggestion worth trying out, but I am not so sanguine about it. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, when you sit on the criminal side, the, the criminal bar will always come and tell you the best judgments have been rendered by lawyers who have not practiced on the criminal side. <laughs> <laughs> So you can never be sure about this. But yes, uh, a certain amount of familiarity and a certain amount of uh, certainty needs to be brought into this field. And in fact, one of the ways we are trying to do this is, uh, in fact, in 2018 itself, when the rules had been amended drastically of the Delhi High Court, we had set up a committee of three judges to examine the patent rules. And we had said that we must have our own rules to expedite uh, the trial and to lay down certain principles which would govern how the process should move to bring about more certainty in the process. That exercise is going on. It is virtually on its last legs, I'm told, and uh, shortly the bar would be taken into confidence with regard to the new patent rules and how the trial would be streamlined. We're trying to bring in the best practices uh, which are known internationally with regard to competition of damages and all. So we hope the process would get streamlined and there would be a lot more certainty in the process. Uh, you would know in the 2018 rules also, we, we, in the general rules itself, we brought in certain concepts which are primarily for the uh, patent trials. That was uh, the confidentiality club, the hot tubbing. So these were concepts which were primarily brought in to help lawyers who practice in this field. But certainty would come, I think, with the special rules, uh, which are in the process of being devised, and they are at their final stage, I'm told. I think another month or two, they would be shared with the bar and then brought in force after some time. So, Mr. Pashnanda, I had one question for you, sir, uh, especially from a, from a commercial lawyer's perspective. Under the uh, Patents Act, we have a provision for appointment of scientific advisors who can aid and assist the courts in understanding the science involved or the or giving evidence on science scientific matters. So what would be your views on also extending the principles of scientific advisors to damages experts? Because damages is as much a science 
as the patent or the invention may have a component of science in it. So, so what are your views on in extending scientific advisors to also include ex damages experts? Sir? So, uh, good question, Siddhant. And I think uh, uh, I, I think this is an area where a, uh, where very good assistance is capable of being provided to courts in India. And I think in calculation of damages, um, uh, you see, when you present as a lawyer, when you present a certain methodology or, or mechanism by which you calculated damages, it is only uh, it is only natural for, for for the judge who's also a lawyer to legally question those concepts and 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 and, and sort of try to understand them. But I think. Um, but I think there are nuances which are capable of being justified on, on principles of accounting and principles that are specific to calculation of damages. And I think there is a lot more comfort and a lot more confidence that can be given uh, to, to the court and assistance that can be given to the court in, in making a final and a comfortable assessment of what the amount of damages should be. Um, now, having said that, I also already see a trend. I mean, there is a there is a growing sort of uh, uh, pool of professionals who provide that kind of assistance to courts and tribunals, and I think uh, I think this will become increasingly significant as we see larger claims for damages being being uh, awarded or being claimed before courts, and I think they will provide very good assistance to courts. Of course, when you when a party brings a damages expert, there will be a counter damages expert that the defendant will bring, and I do not know whether eventually there would even be situations where those two damages experts would be subjected to hot tubbing or, or the court itself would appoint its own expert to take a final view of two competing reports. But yes, broadly speaking, I think this is a very technical area and I think courts are, we are capable of providing much better support and assistance to the courts with the help of damages experts. So there was just one question, uh, Mr. Prashanda, I would like to ask you, how can we as litigators uh, improve the the ex or contribute to the expeditious disposal of patent uh, litigation. Uh, you know, everybody will have. It's a very. Um, I think it, the answer to this question has to be jurisdiction specific, and I think it will also depend on on lawyers. So, I, from my perspective, uh, I personally see that when I'm doing a very big and complicated matter, at least half the time is spent because I am being asked or instructed to argue points which are points, but are not really winning points. They're just points that we consume time. I think, I think if, when you go to a trial, a serious commercial trial, it's very important to know which are the battles that you're going to fight and which are the ones that are not wasting, worth keep wasting your time. And I think that one thing from a lawyer's perspective, of course, from a senior counsel's perspective, of course, if I have the freedom to just choose the main points that I want to win or lose the case on, then I think it would help me uh, focus and try to expedite uh, the matter. Of course, when you look at the case from a solicitor's perspective, you may have different considerations. And uh, from, from, for example, uh, adjournments would, you know, would be one of the issues that you may think of. As a senior counsel's perspective, I don't see that too much as a too much of a problem because I, you know we, I wouldn't, to the extent possible, uh, ensure, I wouldn't allow an, an adjournment to be asked for on my behalf or whatever. But I think from my perspective, the the one factor that I that could help me move on with the case and get it decided very quickly is if, if instead of fighting all the battles or all the points that we've decided to fight on, we could just take on the points that really will decide. The points that ultimately will appeal to the judge and based upon which the court will decide the matter. Those are the points really that you really need to fight about or argue about or lead evidence on. And sometimes we sort of paint on a very large canvas that is that leads to a loss, lot of wastage of time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have, during this webinar, received a host of questions. And I think which, unfortunately, we could not put into the panel due to paucity of time. Perhaps if the panel is to agree, we can organize a follow-up to this webinar. <laughs> the topic to cover particular <laughs> aspects of, the, of this topic and pattern education as a whole. But now, for now, I would like to hand over to Mohit for his closing remarks. Thank you, sir. Um, I would like to thank uh, Honorable Justice Manmohan, Mr. Pashnanda, and Mr. Chapman who have engaged us and the audience in such a thought-provoking discussion today. I also thank the audience who registered in large numbers for this event. Considering we decided 
to go ahead with the event only four days back, we received an enthusiastic response from colleagues and friends from various industries. It is perhaps a topic which was rather interesting and has not been spoken about much in the past. Please do send us feedback about the event. We also extend our gratitude to Fountain Court Chambers for supporting this initiative and to Lex Witness for, for making this webinar a seamless event in such a short span of time. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. I think I've now been caught a deep mid-wicket. I shall go and have some lunch. Pleasure and delight. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. You, Bye.